Few other figures of the settler colonial era have a legacy as disputed as the fifth governor of New South Wales, Lachlan Macquarie, a man whose vision for a self-sustaining colony both severed of its penal origins and furnished with all the splendour and equipment that any advanced state might boast, a landscape brimming with economic progress, social inclusion and industrial expansion, altogether paved the city of Sydney. A legacy, however, we remember today, tainted by behaviour unspeakably offensive to a modern audience. Macquarie was a pioneer. Without the policy agenda of his transformative governorship, the trajectory by which Australia would evolve would have looked remarkably different. This paper will explore how a Scot came to found Australia, tracing his legacy, his controversy, and how contemporary Australians would come to understand his fate. Born under the British Empire in 1762 on the rugged Scottish island of Ulva, Macquarie showed promise from a young age for his innate authority and leadership. While his parents were of humble stock, relatively poor and likely illiterate, young Macquarie was afforded a generous education by his uncle, Captain Murdoch Maclean. Macquarie would likely be enrolled at the Royal High School of Edinburgh. This education imparted the boy with the skills necessary for command determining him proven pragmatic, married not to speculative fancies, but achieving outcomes. In the environment of enlightenment thought that prized the grandeur of abstraction, resolute practicality became Macquarie's advantage. Macquarie's modest beginnings were no deterrent to his development, having joined the British Army, the ground force of the British Armed Forces. Macquarie was deployed to the distant corners of the Empire, first to North America, to India, then on to Egypt, ascending to the rank of Major in 1794 and later achieving the status of Lieutenant Colonel in 1801. He served the Crown in the American War of Independence. Macquarie also contributed to British efforts in India during the Second and Third Mysore Wars, conflicts that would catalyse British triumph over the Indians, culminating in the defeat of the military figure Sultan Tipu. What cannot be ignored is the impetus of the death of Macquarie's first wife, Jane Jarvis, would serve to his career. Sadly, though quite fortuitously for the state of Macquarie's finances, Jane's death in 1796 left him with a helping fortune. This sum would purchase him his way through London. Time passed before in 1808, a small colony located distantly from British shores, New South Wales, would experience instability rout by restless soldiers. This event in short period would come to be known as the Rum Rebellion, a name recognising the then Governor William Bly's attempts to regulate the trade of, uh, you guessed it, rum, the de facto currency integral to the New South Wales economy at the time. Bly, unpopular, obstinate and grotesque to his subordinates, struggled to placate a troop of rabble-rousers and was soon bloodlessly deposed in the coup of 1808, the only military coup in Australian history. Arrangements were required for a new governor to take his place. In January of 1810, did an apprehensive Macquarie and his new wife, Elizabeth, arrive in Sydney Cove. Macquarie initially was rostered as the colony's deputy governor, under Brigadier General Miles Nightingale, but assumed the permanent role soon after the man, first commissioned for the position, fell sick. The landscape he surveyed upon disembarking the ship he regarded as destitute and unfit for his colonial vision. He famously remarked in 1822, upon reflection of his arrival, I found the colony barely emerging from infantile imbecility and suffering from various privations and disabilities. Over the next 12 years of his governorship, Macquarie would sweep Sydney and its surrounds, with change so lasting, its effects can be manifestly observed more than 200 years on. Today, no crevice of Sydney is so far or lonely, it does not bear the mark of Macquarie. From the streets, to the buildings, to the very makeup of the colony's men and women, furnishing a list of Macquarie's accolades can hardly be captured with a simple picture. Though, to start, let us explore his public works program as a natural point from which to proceed. Macquarie was a scrupulous developer. 
His industrious public works schedule saw the development of the Hyde Park Barracks, the Rum Hospital, the Supreme Court Building, the Windsor Courthouse, Lancer Barracks and the South Head Lighthouse in Vaucluse, all of which still stand today. Other works completed but later decommissioned by his successors or demolished altogether include Fort Macquarie, the Convict Barracks and other scattered sandstone and brick structures through the outer regions of the colony. It is estimated 265 public works were built during his tenure, many of which were designed by the former convict and massively influential architect, Francis Greenway. Macquarie's ventures would not be limited to civic works alone, but encompassed too the generous expansion of Australia's social and economic institutions. The construction of the Colonnaded Rum Hospital serves the first instance of a large-scale private-public partnership in Australia's history. Macquarie tendered the public institution in 1810, before striking a carefully termed contract with prolific capitalists in the colony, Darcy Wentworth, Garnham Blacksell, and Alexander Riley. Without the sufficient public monies to sponsor the building, Macquarie offered the investors monopoly on the importation of 60,000 gallons of rum. Macquarie had ironically used the distribution of rum to sponsor healthcare. As Australia's first public hospital, its official completion and opening came in 1816. Utilised by convicts and freedmen, it served the only institution offering healthcare to the poor and vulnerable. Located centrally along Macquarie Street, parts of the building were later repurposed to function as the Parliament of New South Wales. Another colossal institution of enduring import is the Bank of New South Wales. Like several of his other grand ventures, the concept came to Macquarie in his first year as governor in 1810. Its doors would later be opened in 1817. For the bank to operate to any effect, the currency of the colony would need to transition from the rather provincial practice of bartering and passing promissory notes. Macquarie instituted the first official currency in 1813, termed the Holy Dollar, that would replace the exchange of rum, cattle and livestock. The reformed monetary system would prove sound in evolving the colony's economy and providing security for mercantile activity to thrive. Indeed, he struck a reform agenda that both stimulated the private sphere, providing for ample investment opportunity, while embracing a proto-Keynesian approach that established a robust consumer class. Macquarie managed aggregate demand effectively to promote growth. Such lessons in economic theory would stand the duration of Australia's history, a country unafraid to borrow and spend in its pursuit of social objectives. To speak no more of Macquarie's economic reforms is a grave misjustice, as to be explored in the next section. Though to conclude with Macquarie's infrastructure program, he would formalise the structure of Sydney itself by instituting a grid pattern, organising sprawling urban land into rows of buildings accessible by the street. Macquarie personally saw these roads met with his width requirements and would name several of the streets after himself, friends, family, colleagues, and even foe, such as Elizabeth Street, Macquarie Street, of course, Pitt Street, George Street, Bly Street, Castle Ray Street, among others. By government order, he mandated that all vehicles must travel on the left side of the road, not the right side, as is common elsewhere, an order still in effect in Australia today. Macquarie extended Botany Bay even further beyond, with a successful crossing of the Blue Mountains by Blacksland, Lawson and Wentworth in 1813. A road through the mountain pass was commissioned the following year, and in a stupefying feat of engineering and endurance, was engineered in an extraordinary six months. The Great West Road, as it came to be known, brought new territory under the governor's authority, while serving in no small part as a gateway to the pasture lands beyond, heralding the future of a prosperous rural Australia, not alone intoxicated by the flights of the solely coastal imagination. New towns and cities cropped up elsewhere too. Bathurst, Richmond, Campbelltown, Liverpool, Castle Ray, each drawing from the fertile plains beyond Botany Bay to chart new ventures in commerce and agriculture. With this expansion soon followed boundless opportunity and cemented Sydney as a destination. 
Macquarie even gave weight to the name Australia itself. While the name was introduced by the navigator Matthew Flinders, who upon circumnavigating the continent in 1803, would later publish both a map and book under the title Terris Australis, a Latin translation of Southern Land, it was in fact Macquarie who suggested Australia replace New Holland in a dispatch to the Colonial Office in 1817. The idea of Australia itself is known to stretch back as far as Greek antiquity, where Aristotle wrote of the Great Southern Land, somewhat logically balancing the North. Later Latin and medieval scholars became fixated by Terris Australis, incognita, a Great Southern Land shrouded in unknown myth. The name came to popular use in the years following Macquarie's dispatch, before it was gazetted in 1824. The true mark of Macquarie's success was to prove the ease by which he converted labour into capital, furnishing the colony a lively and competitive market economy. He saw the potential of convicts who had little stake in the common good, in the fate of Sydney. The idea of rendering little capitalists neatly tucked into the colony's corners was an idea entirely unique to Macquarie. Australia had always remained a country abundant with land, but scarce with labour. Finding pragmatic and innovative means to bolster the supply of labour was among Macquarie's greatest economic accomplishments. He observed that for New South Wales to flourish, it would need to look beyond the interests of the genteel class and towards the service of common ideals. Former convicts and criminals were offered land through generous grants. These individuals, known as emancipists, provided the foundations for which the colony would grow and bolstered the market with enough manpower both to sustain enterprise and continue as well with Macquarie's ambitious development program. The experimental capitalist program saw the pardoning of approximately 366 people, with a further 1,365 conditional pardons issued and more than 2,300 tickets of leave. Both capitalists and workers stimulated the economy at a scale bearing no precedent. Industry picked up and production skyrocketed. The population of Botany Bay and surrounds more than tripled in the 12 years of Macquarie's tenure. The land was thoroughly meritocratic and had shed its roots as a bastion of convict brutalism. Macquarie had mapped with precision the tenuous path of rehabilitation for the Lowers, but under a carefully contrived civility Rout by steel barracks and stone courthouses. The promise of a redeemed life cast in the shadow of a rigidly imposed, nearing on oppressive order was to become the fate of many of New South Wales' inhabitants. The policy platform was certainly not without its opposition. For one, landowners, free settlers and soldiers were incensed. Former criminals received equal status as the gentility the vested interests of Macquarie's fellow legislators, both within the colony and the imperial administration in London, were deeply conservative, viewing criminals not merely as baser, but unworthy of civil rights. Society for many was not about serving social outcomes, but protecting the status quo. Such was the social milieu of the empire's constituency at this time, deeply divided along aristocratic lines. Anger reached its peak when two former convicts were offered magistracies by Macquarie. So by 1853, when William Wentworth presented the bill to the Legislative Council, Proposing the conferral of hereditary titles upon a few wealthy landholders, did such a proposition seem so absurd, none could treat it earnestly. Imposing an entrenched class system of serfs and lords in Australia seemed as alien as trying to convince the board of Mercedes today of the technological merits of the horse and cart. The affair by Wentworth was infamised by Daniel Dennehy, whose derision was expressed by the term Bunyip aristocracy, denoting the aspiring impostors. The intervening decades, first between Macquarie, then to Wentworth, indeed William Wentworth, the son of Darcy Wentworth who sponsored the Rum Hospital, had sobered this new land, wrung with a resolute egalitarianism and hostility to stratified society. The literature today contends Macquarie's policy betrays an agenda unmistakably stamped with the ideals of the Scottish Enlightenment, a rigorous humanism almost erroneously, prepared to elevate the intrinsic value of the human being. Macquarie's vision, while yet baked with assumptions of imperial expansion 
and service to the empire bore the mark of nation building, of people building. Such measures would forge a quasi-nation. For the first time in history, it thus came to pass that the modern country of Australia emerged. The once settlement, now country, was afforded a clear image of itself. It was given its soul. It was not to be the physical changes Macquarie impressed upon the colony that would last alone, nor really prove the significant factor of his tenure, but the values and ideas sewn into the fabric of how Australia understands itself. His approach to premiership would replumb the definition of governor, an individual charged not to merely administer, but actively lead and direct with a daring nearing on utopian vision. Premiers serve not their own interests, nor the hangovers of the British aristocratic heritage, but the whole of the people, from the lowliest convicts and criminals to the stateliest gentlemen. Macquarie fundamentally shaped settler Australia for the better, bringing order, democracy and civility to an infantile naval colony. His successes would prove forged of this same anvil, though not to the same effect. They were nevertheless ambitious pragmatists, who viewed Sydney as a society free of the pangs of its convict, militant beginnings, while often flawed at times, while meaning in its intentions, and set upon securely built tracks. But what was to become of Macquarie's darker side? You cannot discuss Macquarie today and the leadership of Australia's colonial settler era without acknowledgement of the profound trauma inflicted upon Australia's traditional custodians. Macquarie gave directions in 1816 for Captain Wallace, Lieutenant Dorr and Captain Shaw to command advancing military detachments west in expanding the colonial frontier. What would unfold would be known as the Appen Massacre, a bloody affair in Australian history where 14 Aboriginal men, women and children were killed. As chief strategist, Macquarie anticipated the violence would have a two-pronged consequence, displacing the Indigenous communities southwest of Sydney from their land and striking the greater terror into the survivors who might thus be deterred from further hostility. The diary of the soldiers who carried out the massacre detail the firing upon men, women and children in the early hours of the morning as they sat around a campsite. In escaping the rain of bullets, some victims jumped off a nearby cliff, plummeting to their deaths. Such a fate seemed preferable to the shower of gunfire. In Sydney's Hyde Park, the park Macquarie would found in 1817, there stands a petrified statue of Macquarie in shining bronze. Enshrined at its base, in no uncertain terms there is written, he was a perfect gentleman, a Christian and a supreme legislator of the human heart. Macquarie's role in authorising the Appen Massacre is, to put it mildly, a nebulous exercise of reconciliation in the hearts of Indigenous ancestors, those who still live the magnitude of post-1788. Joan Ritchie's 1987 biography recounts of Macquarie his observance of Indigenous populations at the Parramatta Institution, an institution dedicated to educating Indigenous youth through a process of civilization. As the Aborigines feasted on roast beef washed down with copious draughts of beer, he, Macquarie, examined the children of the native institution. He knew that the rapid increase in British population and the progress of British agriculture had driven these people from their ancient habitations. Macquarie, while a child of empire, understood there lay a certain depravity at the heart of British progress. The colonial project, as an implement of dispossession and violence for many, plagued Macquarie. An enduring inner turmoil came to feature prominently in his diary entries. For the time of early settler colonialism, Macquarie stands out among the most benevolent of Europeans, or least malicious, in his treatment of indigenes. Assimilation, as he mistakenly presumed was the answer to this turmoil, would later prove another false assumption of imperialism. Among Macquarie's primary fixations was order. In fact, it was not indigenous people alone who were subjected to this ruinous tendency, but so too were other unfortunate peoples who fell out of line. 
Irish convicts, among other prisoners, often put to the gallows for their crimes. Macquarie was keenly privy to the costs of success. Indeed, his instincts were forged in the crucible of empire. Understanding the environment is paramount to understanding the man himself. But without a historically painting the indigenous populations as a romanticized and peaceful society, never before had they known such violence. The most cutting-edge historical research suggests there were more than 200 massacres of indigenous peoples recorded post-1788. The indigenous Australian population fell 84% through to 1900 following this period, falling from 770,000 to 117,000, while the majority of the decline came from disease and plummeting birth rates and the introduction of new goods and technology. The role of frontier conflict in forming this figure is but folly to argue against. To some, Macquarie stands out as a transformative character and a purveyor of civility, egalitarianism, procedural fairness, while deeply committed to fostering socio-economic development of the local indigenous population, a point emphasized innumerably by his earlier biographers. These measures, tasked at improving indigenous education and welfare set by Macquarie, did not, however, prevent the violence. To others, Macquarie was a man of monstrous disposition who treated the indigenous population and those deemed lesser populations with terrifying impunity. Through the latter lens, our contemporary accounts of Macquarie require revision. To see him not as the perfect gentleman, but someone complicit in organized massacre. The role of decolonizing Macquarie is underway. Anyone yet to realize this must pay closer attention. One must not analyze figures like Macquarie through a 21st century moral prism, nor dismiss, however, the plight of those displaced and dispossessed by settler colonialism. Perhaps it is Macquarie's moral ambiguity that commands our attention, or more appropriately, his campaign, nearing propagandistically to mold the architecture, roads, public amenities and facilities, all in the image of himself that has rendered him an inevitable figure in Australian history. To answer with earnest determination whether Macquarie was a man or a monster is to ask a very significant question. Perhaps prosecuting this matter deeper, a more appropriate question arises. Can we balance the crimes of historical forebears with the plights of their circumstances?